Welcome back to the Rifamonas Reproducible Research Tutorial Series. I hope you were able to make it to the last tutorial, where we added an R script to our driver file to generate a figure with an ordination plot. I'm constantly amazed by the growing number of resources that are available in both R and Python to make our data analyses more reproducible. One of these new resources is R Markdown. This is a blend of Markdown, which we've already discussed when talking about documentation, and R code, which we discussed in the previous tutorial. R Markdown has revolutionized how my research group approaches scientific publishing. Emerging from the Python ecosystem, there's a similar tool called Jupyter Notebooks. Both R Markdown and Jupyter are examples of literate programming in which native text is blended with computer code. The results are pretty marvelous. Have you ever had to update numbers in a manuscript after changing a parameter, using a different statistical analysis, or adding more data? It's painful. More than one time, I've had errors slip into my manuscripts before, because I forgot to update all of the numbers. And tables with dozens of values? Ah, what a pain! Literate programming removes that pain. If you look at my papers from my research group that are posted on GitHub, you can find R Markdown documents that contain R code behind any summary statistic or p-value. The tables are generated by R code. Furthermore, Combined with the idea of a driver script, which we've been developing in this tutorial series, not only can you find the code for the summary statistic, but you can track it all the way back to a raw data file. If you remember back to the introduction for this series, I mentioned an April Fool's joke we played introducing a write.paper function into Mother. Well, our markdown is basically that function. I can't wait to show you how to write research reports and manuscripts using our markdown. Join me now in opening the slides for today's tutorial which you can find within the Reproducible Research Tutorial Series on the Rifamonas.org website. Before we get going and discussing literate programming with R Markdown, I have a brief pop quiz for you that will hopefully jog your memory in how we can work with R from our pipeline. So the question is, how would you run a function? So for example, we saw before plot NMDS from our R script, which is also called plot NMDS.R at the bash shell prompt. Take a couple moments and see if you can look back through your notes or if you remember off the top of your head how you would go ahead and run this function from this R script without first going into R. So hopefully that jogged your memory and you had some recollection of doing this in the previous tutorial. But recall that we can use R-E to execute a string of commands from the bash command line. And so that needs to be, those commands need to be embedded within single or double quotes. They need to match. And the individual commands can be separated with a semicolon. So here, bound within double quotes, we have two commands. We have a source function and a plot nmds function. The source function loads the code from code plot nmds.r. Uh, that file name is wrapped in single quotes. And then we run plot nmds. And that takes a .axes file um, that is also wrapped in single quotes. Man, that's a long file name. So again, if we run this from within from the bash command prompt, we don't have to go into R, but the code will still get run, and then it'll quit out of R. And so this is really nice if we want to be able to automate our pipeline, because we can run R code without actually having to manually go into R. So for today's tutorial, I hope to help you learn how to express a manuscript as an extension of a programmatic analysis, to really see that typing and writing our, our text, our narrative, can be fused with program, programmatic analyses, and this is what we call literate programming. Within our markdown, they use code chunks and inline code to insert information into the text. So we'll talk about how to do that. And we'll also implement advanced R markdown features, including uh, citations, figures, and tables, to make it more of a polished manuscript. And then we'll talk about YAML and YAML material that can be used to impact the format of your output. So looking at this paragraph that you've already seen and copied into your main readme file, this is the paragraph called Scaling Up from the Kozich Analysis. 
you'll notice that there's a variety of numbers in here that we had to calculate somewhere, right? So uh, down here, there's an error rate of 0.07% for the two mock communities, um, another 0.01% after further curation, and we had 14,094 sequences. All of these numbers would need to be updated if we changed the data set, if we changed how we calculated error, um, if we changed any steps in the pipeline, right? And if you look at this one paragraph, there's maybe a dozen or so different numbers that are being um, generated elsewhere, right? And so here in these red rectangles are those numbers that we had to calculate somewhere. Right? So whether it's the number of samples, a citation number, numbers of sequences, numbers of reads per sample, um, and so forth, p-values, that we had to generate somewhere and then insert into the text. Similarly, here's a table from that same paper where there's maybe a um, hundred or so different numbers that if we, uh, again, change the pipeline or if we added uh, another run of data, we would have to update this table. And that could just be a royal pain um, because you're sure, you're sure to introduce all sorts of errors in doing that. And so to think about what goes into a paper beyond the narrative, we have things like counts, the numbers of things, we have calculated values, we have p-values, we have references, figure numbers, the actual figures and tables themselves. Each of these can be added and addressed into a paper, into a manuscript, using literate programming. Literate programming is the idea that we can merge code with text generation and formatting. Literate programming was developed and championed by a world-renowned computer scientist named Donald Knuth. And currently there are several modern options. So as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, there is Jupyter and R Markdown um, from the Python and R environments respectively. From these types of literate programming we can get many types of output whether it's a markdown plain text file, a PDF, a Word docx file, or HTML code for rendering on a website. Thinking about R markdown there's a lot of applications that have come out of the ability to use R markdown in the packages R markdown and knitter which are two packages we'll use that work together. People have used R Markdown to write books, create slide decks, blogs, and interactive websites. It's been really powerful. I liken it to a cookbook, that if you go into Amazon and look at the reviews for a random cookbook, invariably you'll find reviews that say, this cookbook described how to make these types of cookies, but the cookies taste awful. Well. Think about a slide deck where you're teaching R or you're showing somebody your code and your figure. It's like giving someone the cookie and the recipe used to make the cookie, right? Well, we can have the plot or the p-value and the code right there with it to know um, how those values were calculated or how those images were generated. I have taught entire semester-long courses using slide decks built using R Markdown. And why we're here dis discussing this today is that I write now manuscripts entirely in our markdown. And again, if we think about this paragraph and the various values that we might want to calculate using R, we can now look at this example of our markdown. Not all of the numbers have been converted to our markdown, but you might look over here and you'll see these back ticks with R and then R code embedded. This R code when it's rendered by Knitter and R Markdown together, will spit out a number telling, uh, telling the reader how many pairs of reads there were per sample. And so this is going to be pretty foreign to you right now, but by the end of this tutorial, hopefully you'll understand what's going on here. So hopefully you recall that we previously used Markdown in the paper airplane example and in our readme files for providing documentation. Our markdown is the idea that we can take that markdown and embed R code into it to generate text, tables, and figures. The R markdown package from R uses the knitter package and other goodies to convert, convert R markdown files into a variety of formats. And so you can see the schematic from RStudio where you write in R markdown 
use Knitter to convert that to Markdown, and then a program called Pandoc will convert that Markdown into a variety of formats. This whole pipeline is fairly opaque to you. All you need to worry about is writing the R Markdown, setting what the output you want it to be, and you'll get it. And that is all done using the programs Knitter and R Markdown. So the outputs we can get include Markdown for basic text. And again, if we were to look at this on uh, some, a site like GitHub, where it automatically converts Markdown to HTML, that would serve our purposes. Alternatively, we can generate HTML-based websites. This is really nice for lab reports and affords you limitless formatting options using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, if you want. You can also write have things outputted as a docx file. This is great for manuscripts. Uh, it, we find that it's easier for our collaborators to work with the docx file than say the R markdown file. Uh, there is a bit of a limited formatting issue. Uh, you can format using a template.x file where in that template file you provide the formatting that you want. Things like what font do you use, what size, double spacing, line numbering, things like that. We can also output PDFs. I, f I find that this is my preference for manuscripts, but I find that it's harder for my collaborators to work with because they tend to want to get into the text and mess with it and do things like track changes and all the things they're used to doing. Um, but there is then limitless formatting via LaTeX. And so uh, you don't need to know LaTeX to generate a PDF, but it does then allow you to have more options in formatting. There are various helpers within the new project directory uh, template that we'll talk about later. And so, again, there's a range of outputs for papers. You need to find what works best for you and your collaborators in terms of the output. So we can do all of this through RStudio. They also have a no nice notebook-like interface, and they have various helpers to make things easier. But we're not going to use RStudio. I'm sorry. Um, because we're trying to emphasize the importance of having a workflow that's automated and can run without our intervention. Having to then go into a graphical interface kind of limits that. I'm also assuming that you'll likely want to run everything on a cluster and may not be able to run a graphical interface on your server. I know that there's a huge uh, barrier to using a graphical user interface um, on my local Flux cluster or even going on to Amazon. So what we're going to do is to return to our Kozich analysis. We're first going to log into our instance and start FileZilla so it'll be easier to transfer files back and forth and see what's were being generated. Previously in the tutorial on organization, you copied the scaling up paragraph into your readme file. We're going to move that now to our submission practice RMD file. So this practice RMD file is going to be a new file that we'll generate and we'll use for practicing various aspects of uh, using our markdown. So I've been able to log into my instance and I'm going to go ahead and move to my Kozich reanalysis AM 2013 directory. LS, and we're in the right place. So again, I'm going to open my readme file. And I see my scaling up paragraph here. And I'm going to copy that. Control X out. And I said nano submission practice dot rmd. And that gets me my scaling up. And I forget if my readme also had the figure legend. Uh, it doesn't look like it. So I'm going to open back up submission practice dot rmd. And I'm going to copy the figure legend for figure four. So again, this is a bit artificial because rarely would we want to go back and add the R code. You certainly can, 
but it's much easier to write the R code as you're actually writing the paper. Okay, we'll save this and exit out. Next, we'd like to go ahead and look at our .r profile file. So if we do ls, you'll notice we don't see a .r profile file, but if you do ls-a, in here, the bottom right, we have a .r profile file. This is the file that is loaded whenever we run R. Now, we talked about in the last tutorial that we don't want to put a lot of stuff into this .r profile file. So let's see what's in there. So we'll do nano.rprofile, and it says library knitter, library r markdown, and then it sets paths for where to put things from knitter and from r markdown, and it helps to um, normalize our path and to, to get things in the right place. So everything looks good here. One other thing I'll add is that the AWS instance you have has knitter and R markdown already installed. So you don't need to install packages uh, for, for R markdown or knitter. We'll go ahead and reopen our submission practice.rmd file. And we're going to start the process of converting this into an R markdown document. At a minimum, to can make it an R Markdown document, we need to add what's called a YAML header. So a YAML header is, is denoted by having three hyphens on the first line, some information, and then three hyphens to close the YAML header. In between the three hyphens, we need to add information that tells R Markdown and Knitter and Pandonk eventually what exactly needs to be done. So in here we'll put output colon space HTML document. So our YAML headers will get a little bit more complicated as we go along, but it's important to note that we never want to put a tab in our YAML header. Any kind of justification along the left side, left margin, we want to do with spaces. So we'll go ahead and save and quit this. And so then from our command line, we can render this doing r-e quote render single quote submission forward slash practice dot rmd single quote parentheses close quote. Remember, we don't need to put library r markdown or library knitter in here because that's automatically loaded as part of our, our profile file. So we'll run this. And it runs pretty quickly. And we see output created practice.html. So I need to connect to my AWS instance in FileZilla. And I need to update my IP address. And I'm going to get that from my AWS instance. copy it to the clipboard, come back over here, paste that in, connect. Yes, I'll trust them, okay. Cosich reanalysis, submission, uh, practice.html. Opening that up, I see I now have a HTML formatted version of the scaling up file. That's great. So at a basic level, we see that it works. So let's add a title, date, and author to our YAML. So I'm going to reopen my submission practice file. And I'm going to add title. And I'll say reproducing Kozich et al. Author. I'm going to put my name in. You put your name in. Patch loss. Date. And I'm going to say uh, April 24th, 2018. And I'll go ahead and save this, and quit. And then back out in my um, in Bash, I'm going to render this. 
and I can then go to FileZilla. I can refresh and refresh here. Uh, maybe I need to double click again on it. Uh, reopen local file. Uh, discard local file, then download and edit file anew. Okay, so now we see we have a title. I lost the all. <laughs> uh, my name and my date. Right, so it nicely puts in this information that we added into the YAML header. So I'll return to my RMD file. And if we look down in here, we see that there's a couple numbers here. 4.3 million pairs of sequence reads from the 16S RNA gene with an average coverage of 9,913 pairs of reads per sample. With 95% of the samples had more than 2,454 pairs of sequences. Okay. What I'd like to do is to automate those calculations in my RMD file. So to do this, we'll need to create what's called a code chunk. And we'll also need to make use of what's called inline code. A code chunk is denoted in R markdown by three back ticks, a curly brace, an R, and a curly brace. And then the code chunk ends with another set of three back ticks. So if you have a bunch of paragraphs in your paper, you can have code chunks scattered throughout your document. Because our document's pretty small here, we're only gonna have one code chunk. And so because this isn't an R course, I'm gonna copy the notes, the, the code, I'm sorry, from the slide deck into the code chunk here. And, um, and so we see, I'm gonna add some spacing here so we can kind of differentiate what's going on. Okay, so we've got our shared file name. We're reading in our shared file with the R code. We're counting the number of sequences in each row. And then we're getting the sequence counts in millions by counting up the number of sequences divided by a million, the average sequence counts using the mean function, and then the percentile of the sequence counts here in the in, in this final line of the code chunk. Okay, so we're this is the code that's going to be used later in the paragraph to embed into our, our sentence. Okay. And so this 4.3 million is going to come from this million sequence counts. Okay. And so these three variables hold information that's going to go into this paragraph using what I'm calling inline code. All right, so 4.3 million pairs I'm going to remove that 4.3 and put in a back tick R, and I have another back tick. And so this means in these between the back ticks, we're going to put R code that's going to be run and inserted directly into the sentence. So I'm going to say million sequence underscore counts. All right. Similarly, down here we have average coverage. I'm going to replace this with R, backtick R. And inside the backticks, I'm gonna put average sequence counts. And then in here, the 95% of samples had more than 2,454 pairs of sequences. I'm gonna do again, R, backtick R, backtick. And inside the backticks, I'm going to put percentile sequence counts. All right, so see how we did that? We have a code chunk up here that reads in the file, it does the calculations, and then down here in the narrative part of the text, we can call on these variables that were defined up here in the code chunk to be inserted in directly. Now, we could have put everything in this code chunk directly into the inline code, but that would get really painful to read and difficult to edit later. And so again, we can use this code chunk to define variables that we then insert into the text. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this. 
and re-render. Oh, average sequence counts not found, so I'm gonna check that out again. Up, oh, and I misspelled sequence up here in my code chunk. Save that. Re-render. Everything worked. I'll come over to FileZilla. Refresh. Reopen. I'm going to discard and then download the file anew. Aha! And so now what we see is that we have our code chunk. And then in this sentence where we put the, the, our R code, we see we generated 3.86 million pairs of sequence reads with an average covered of 1.07, blah, 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 times 10 to the 4 pairs of reads per sample. Okay, so the information is here, but the formatting leaves a little bit to be desired. So how well did we reproduce the previous results? Well, the numbers are pretty close. Um, the the Kozich paper originally was not generated using an R Markdown document. Uh, they're pretty close. Uh, there were two data sets available, so it's possible we grabbed the wrong data set or that I used a different date that the, there was one data set that was the with metagenomics and one was without the metagenomics. So we may have grabbed the, the wrong one that I used orig originally. We could go back and check that out. There have also been software changes to Mother over the years, so that might cause some things. There's also some randomness at different steps in the pipeline. Um, and, and it's also possible that the, the total number of sequences was really the number of raw sequences. And what we have here is the number of curated sequences that made it through our pipeline. And so these are all things that would have been nice if we would have documented it the first time around. We have since gone back and regenerated this paper using uh, reproducible practices. And the numbers are pretty close and, and the, the gist of the story doesn't change. So this is really cool, right? There's still a bunch of things we'd like to do with this before we'd submit it to a journal or even share it with a collaborator. And so let's just think about what we've done first. Okay, we've created a code chunk. Uh, we don't, th and that, that reads in the file and it does some processing of the data. For when we submit it, we probably don't want to see the code. We'd like to hide that. But for our PI or select collaborators, we may want to show them the code so that we have proof of our methods and they can see what we've done. Um, the inline code, uh, the number of significant digits is a bit over the top. Okay. So what we're going to first do is look at how we can get rid of this seeing this code chunk. We still want it to run, but we don't want to see it. So if we go back into our, our markdown document, inside our curly braces after the R, we can write echo equals false. What echo equals false will do will it will not echo the code. So echo equals true is what we currently have where it echoes back the code to the screen. So we quit out, we re-render, and now the code chunk is gone but our the results of our R are still in the sentence. So there's some other code chunk options that are useful um, so include tells whether the code and results should be in the output. Um, it's, it will still run the code. Echo tells whether the code but not the results should be in the output. It will still run the code. Uh, message, true or false, tells whether the messages that are generated by the code should be in the output. And then warning, true or false, tells whether warning messages that are generated by the code should be in the output. In the slide deck, there's a link to many other options that are available for how to format figures, do things like caching, um, make dependencies between code chunks. But again, for most of what I do in my papers, I'm mainly using echo, message, and warning um, in my code chunks. One of the things that we tend not to think about when we use R a lot is how to format text or to format numbers. Normally, we're happy to pull a p-value pull a summary statistic out of R, but with our markdown, we really want to pull it into another document. So we need to think about how we format things. So returning to submission practice, oops. I 
if I scroll down to where I embedded my R code, I probably want to round this number that we had as output. And we can do this with a function called round and format. And so I can say format round million sequences, million sequence counts. And so for rounding, I'm going to say uh, round to one significant digits. And then for format, I'm going to say n small equals 1l, close parentheses. And what this will do is this will return a single digit or a number with a single um, one significant digit, and nothing to the right of the decimal point. So if we save, render, and then open that up. So we see that we've got one significant digit to the right of the decimal point, 3.9, which is what we were hoping for. So that's a lot tidier. We can do the same type of thing. We can do the same type of thing with the other numbers that we generated. So if we go back to nano, and we look at our average sequence counts, We can do the same thing where we round it to one significant digit. Format, round, comma one, comma n small equals one L, close parentheses. And we'll do the same thing here with our percentile, where we'll do format, round, one, one L. Quit, render. Mm -hmm. And so we see much nicer formatting. So we have um, 10,735.1 pairs as the average instead of you know, something in scientific notation, and then 2,788.9 pairs of sequences. So in this sentence, we had three numbers, 3.9, 10.735.1, 2788.9, that were all generated from R. If we return to our R code, and we, we look down at this, we might notice that this isn't very dry, that we have the same format round and then the number and the same parameters over and over again. And so what we'd like to do is to perhaps remove this so we don't have to repeat it, but that our text can be formatted, our numbers can be formatted the same way every time um, we're outputting text. What we'll do is we'll go up and we'll create another code chunk And I'm gonna, we can name our code chunks. So I'm gonna name this one uh, knitter settings. And I'm gonna say eval equals true. So we're gonna evaluate what's in here. Our echo is gonna be false. And we're gonna say cache equals false. And we close that with three back ticks. And in here, I'm going to set several chunk options. So we can globally set our chunk options. So I'm going to say ops chunk dollar sign set uh, parentheses tidy equals true. And I'm going to copy this several times so I don't have to keep typing. So we'll do tidy equals true. Tidy refers to how the code is formatted. Echo equals false. We've already seen fault echo where it um, outputs the code chunk. Um, eval equals true. Warning equals false. And 
hash equals false. You might want to run this a couple times with warning equals true. Um, you might want to run once with warning equals true just to make sure you're not getting any problematic warning or error messages when you run your analysis. So if you look at the slide deck, there is a function in the slide deck called inline hook that I'm going to copy and paste into here. And this is a function that is run every time it does an inline code chunk, okay? Wherever you see that backtick R and then R code, it runs this function on the contents within those backticks. And so you'll, you'll see that there's information in here on what to do. Um, some of this we don't need to worry about. Um, is it a list? Unlist it and spit it out as a vector. But if it's numeric, um, then it does different things. So it'll format it with commas and no, no um, uh, special digits for formatting. If it's um, not scientific or if it's not an integer, it will um, again use commas and it'll use one significant digit and it won't use scientific notation. So this first one is saying, is it an integer? If it's an integer, don't use a, a decimal. If it's not an integer, then use one significant digit. And so what this allows us to do then is to uh, go back into our code, our inline code, and to reformat the text. The other thing is that this code chunk would be a great place to load any libraries that we had to run. So we could source any utilities or we could library any packages that we're using in here. And so again, we can come down to our text and we can remove these format round function calls. And from here. And here. So we can save this and exit out, render it. And we see that we have the same formatting of our text, but the text is much more dry. Some other things we'll want to deal with include figures and tables, references, and then other output formats. And so that's what we're going to spend the rest of this tutorial discussing. My preference in working with figures in a manuscript is to not generate the figure within my RMD file. Well, if you're using an RMD file as a notebook, like we saw in the Meadow et al. paper, then that makes sense to leave it in there. But normally when I'm submitting a manuscript, I have to submit the figures separate from the text. And so, um, and also sometimes the figures require a fair amount of code to generate. And I like to encapsulate that away into a separate file. But we can still see the figures show up in our RMD, in our output from our RMD file. And, and that is using um, our markdown code. So let's go back into our practiced RMD file. And I'm going to come to the bottom where I have my figure legend. And under that, we can use Markdown to insert an image. So I'm going to, uh, and the syntax is descript, is, let me type and then I'll talk. Um, so the syntax is, as, as you see here, and that we use an exclamation point, square bracket, and inside the square bracket, bracket is the description. If you're familiar with HTML, this is like the alt um, attribute for uh, an image tag. And then we give the path to get to the figure. All right. And so I'm going to change my description to be figure one. 
And then the path to figure is going to be a little bit weird because we need to give it a relative path to our submission directory. So we're going to do dot dot slash results forward figures forward nmds underscore figure dot png. And if we save this and render, hopefully that figure will now be inserted into the output of our RMD file. And sure enough, there is our figure. Now I could get rid of the text inside the description and that figure one will go away. So I don't really want to see that. And again, it's gone now. Okay, so that's how I tend to insert figures if I'm going to put figures into a manuscript. Again, when you submit a manuscript frequently, you're not going to put the figures in with the figure legends. But if you're doing it for a, um, a report to give to your PI or a draft, then it, it's nice to be able to put the figures in with the manuscript. So we're going to go ahead and add a silly table to our, our markdown document. And I'm going to put this at the end because normally I have tables at the end of my manuscripts. And because this isn't a tutorial on R necessarily, I'm going to go ahead and create a code chunk and copy the code over from uh, the, the slide deck. So there's my, my, um, my code chunk frame. And I'll add this as, say, table one is the name of my code chunk. The names aren't critical. Uh, sometimes it's helpful for debugging where things go wrong because it'll give you an error message of, of where, where problems happened. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste this code from the slide decks over in. And um, you can see what's perhaps what's happening is that we make a column for days, number of samples per days mean samples per day per sample, and the total sequences per days. Um, and then we have a loop that goes through and counts these things. But then we're, we get to the table is that it, it makes a data frame that has four columns. Uh, unique days, so what are the days of the study? The mean sequences per day per sample, so how many sequences do we have per day per sample? The total sequences by day, and then the number of samples we have by day. This then gets us into cable, which is that package, that function, I'm sorry, in our markdown that will build a nice table for us. We give it our name of our data frame. Next comes digits, which is the number of numbers to the right of the decimal point that we're going to use in formatting our table. We're not gonna use any row names. Our column names are gonna be day, seeks per sample mean. Uh, BR is a bit of HTML to put in a line break sequences per day total, and number of samples. Finally, we tell Cable to align our columns to be the center. Um, and, and so just to show you a little, we can, we can give this as a string where each letter in the string tells you whether, tells Knitter where, where, whether it should be center, right, left, center, whatever, um, where you want the number positioned horizontally within the table. So if we save this, we render it, we then load it from FileZilla, and we see that we get a data frame. So if you recall, we made the first column left formatted, center, right, center. Okay. And also we said zero digits to the right for the day one, one to the right for column two, zero and zero for the other two columns as well. So we can put in some nice formatting. And again, this is all HTML. And if you know some CSS, you could format this to look um, a bit more like, a bit more polished or a bit more like you would like it to look. But again, this is a bit of a silly example telling us for each day of the mouse study, how many sequences we have per sample, the total number of sequences across all of our samples for that day, and the number of samples that we have. So you see that, you know, on day 302, we had one sample, but on day zero, we had 12 samples from our 12 different mice. So again, 
this is how we can put a figure and now a table into our, our markdown document. The next thing that we want to be able to do is to put references inside of our R code. And one of the things that we need to tell it is what type of formatting we want to use. Uh, and so there's a variety that will work with our markdown, um, Word, and LaTeX. And so we can find these in what's called the CSL GitHub repository, which you can find in the slide deck a link to. Um, we commonly use style guides for the ASM journals, and there's a copy of that called mbio.csl in the directory CSL. So if we um, submission, you'll see here there's mbio.csl. And so we can see the CSL GitHub repository. We can see the CSL repository by going to the GitHub repository, citation style languages slash styles. And you'll see in here any number of journals uh, represented. And you can search for the one you want because there's so many of them um, up here. So if we did um, I spelled American wrong. American. Nope, that's right. And so ah, we see one for applied environmental microbiology or uh, a variety of the um, ASM journals in here. So if we wanted applied environmental microbiology, we would copy this file um, and then pop this into our submission directory and we would name it. And so this is what we've done, but with the mbio.csl. And returning to our, our markdown document, we'll need to make a couple of changes. To our, we'll add to our YAML header, we'll say CSL mbio.csl. And then we also need to tell it where our bibliography is. So we'll do bibliography dot bibliography equals references dot bib. And we'll save that. But now we need to create references dot bib. And we'll also have to insert our references into our text here. So we'll quit out of that. And we will create a reference file. We'll do submission references. Oh, sorry, nano submission references.bib. And by default, we put in here uh, the mother paper, uh, so Schloss 2009. And this is the type of formatting that we need to um, uh, represent our, our papers. And so I want to get two out of here. And so one is the original paper um, that uh, these data were taken from. And so I will go to uh, PubMed. And the authors on that were Schloss, Schubert, Zakular. And that's this. And I'm going to copy this DOI number. And there's a nice tool called doi to biborg And we can give it a DOI, a PMC ID, or an archive ID. And so if I hit enter on that, I get nice bibtech formatted um, uh, material. So I can copy that. And I can go back in here. And I can paste that in. And so now I've got uh, these two. And the other file that I want is, um, or the other paper, sorry, that I want is, if I go back to PubMed, is Clayton and um, MK, U, J, C. Uh, and this is the theta YC and so we need to get the DOI number. So I'll click on the paper. Ah, there's the DOI. And so I can click this DOI and go back to DOI to bib. And there we go. So I can copy that now into my references.bib file. 
Okay. And now I have three files or three papers represented in my bib file. So to cite these in our manuscript, we now want to go back into submission, practice, RMD. And we want to replace this 18 with our reference. So we'll do square bracket at Schloss 2012. And this is coming from our references file. So if you scroll down to where we had Schloss 2012, this is the name that we're going to cite, Schloss 2012. Similarly, if we wanted to use um, cite the theta yc, this u2001 would be what we'd cite. So let's go ahead and put that in. And scrolling to the bottom, uh, where we have this 28, we're going to see that that was at u2001. I'll quit that, and we can then render it. This runs through. We then open up this, and we see U Clayton has a two, and the uh, original mouse study has a one. And if we scroll to the bottom, we see our references. So maybe we'd want to say, um, we'd want to add, so nano submission. At the bottom, we could put in you know, double pound references. Okay. So we have references and then list of our references. And that's pretty sweet. Right? So we can do references, we can do tables, we can put figures into our, our mar doc markdown documents. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different output formats that we can get from our, our markdown documents. And this is all going to be set in that YAML head header material. We've already seen how we can output HTML. As I mentioned, we can output markdown, we can output Word document files, PDFs, and many others. Each of these formats have many, many, many options that are constantly being updated and added. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in that, to check on those, click on those links and to go to the R Markdown site where they have really great documentation on how you can customize the output further. I'm going to give a brief description of how we can do different things. We've already seen with HTML using output HTML document. Uh, with Markdown, we can say output equals MD document. We can also do a Word document, uh, so Word underscore document. It's a little bit beyond what I want to do right now, um, but we have the ability to generate a template to customize the formatting. Um, it can be a little bit limiting. There might be ways to figure out line numbers, but it's it's not trivial. It's problems with some problems with table formatting, bulleted lists, and um, no forced line breaks. So, but at the same time. <laughs> people you're working with are going to want a Word file. So what we generally do is we generate the Word file knowing that we're going to send it to collaborators. We then manually format it to get the fonts and the spacing and everything the way we want it, and we send them the Word file. It maybe takes five minutes to, to kind of take what we get as a Word file out of Knitter to convert into what we, we want to send to our collaborators. A PDF is also a powerful tool, um, you, but you first have to have a full installation of tech on your system to render it as a PDF. Um, I think it render offers the best possible output look, um, but there's a bit of a learning curve and there's a variety of things that you're gonna have to add uh, using LaTeX. Um, we have some help things built into um, the, the new project template that we're gonna be using here in a minute. We can also generate output that's a combination of various types, PDF, Word, Markdown, whatever you want. Um, perhaps one collaborator wants a PDF, one wants a Word document, um, you know, go crazy. Um, I'll often render a PDF and a Word version for me and my collaborators 
respectively because uh, I like working with a PDF I like the way it looks so it feels good to me um, of course others want a word document so they can do track changes I still like to get a pen and kind of mark things up manually so we also have this new project RMD template uh, that was in there you'll notice in the submission directory there is a file called manuscript.rmd and we will render that as we did for practice RMD and so hopefully you'll see what's similar and what we're going to do is to copy what we had from that scaling up paragraph into the results section of our manuscript and we're going to um, go ahead and re-render what we had there so again if we do ls submission we see down here that we have manuscript.rmd and i should add that um, tech comes pre-installed with this Amazon image. And like I said earlier, if you want to render to PDF, you have to install tech on your own. And there's instructions on how to do that on the RM, the, the R Markdown website that's linked uh, through those slide notes. So let's open up manuscript.rmd. And we see that there's some built-in YAML material here for you. Um, there's also this set of um, knitter settings for you that's already here and uh, we've got a running title space names for your authors this is the cover page you could customize this the way you want there's an abstract um, various sections of the paper so if you were writing a paper you could take this template and you could populate all these sections right? uh, and then we've got figure legends references and so forth so what we're going to do is I'm going to copy the material from practice into manuscript.rmd. So we'll do submission, practice. I'm going to use cat to output submission uh, practice.rmd. And this will make it easier for me to copy and paste. So I'm going to grab this code chunk all the way down to here, copy nano submission manuscript rmd and i'm going to throw this in my results section okay and then i'm going to take um, my figure four and my figure copy that and put this down at the bottom um, and replace this here Great, I'm gonna save that, back out. So again, what we've done is we've taken our results, our scaling up paragraph, put it into the results section of, of this manuscript.rmd file. I'm gonna save it. And now to render it, again, we can do r-e, quote, render, submission, manuscript.rmd single quote parentheses double quote we run that it will generate manuscript.pdf for us and go to go to filezilla we see that we now have manuscript.pdf we'll download this and we see we get out name of study. We could update this stuff if we wanted, of course. And so here in our results and discussion, scaling up paragraph that has, um, again, the code we added uh, in our inline code. And again, here's our figure. Uh, this is a PNG file, so it's, the quality is pretty poor, but you know we could update that and fix that as well. All right, so again, we've seen how to output a um, HTML file as well as a PDF file and it looks pretty nice. We've got line numbers, uh, we've got that cover page that we could update and, and, and fix um, a bit to get it ready for submission. So as a closing note, we can also put code into our header material. So here's a way to put whatever today's date is in as the date. We're using our assist time to get the time, the date, um, that it will then go into the date for our report. We can also feed in parameters like a function um, 
treating the R Markdown document like a function, where we might say have grade reports or something like that that we're doing for a class, or some monthly report that we're doing for um, kind of updating a project. We can run that uh, by feeding it specific data files to generate kind of reproducible report reports where the underlying data is changing uh, and it's then reflected in the output into the report. We've really done a lot today with our markdown documents and thinking about how we can use our markdown documents to make research reports as well as manuscripts that embed code into our, our science narrative. Of course, what we're going to want to do before we quit is to commit as well as log out of AWS. But before you do, I would really encourage you to edit your scaling up code and paragraph further to automate the printing of another number or two from that paragraph. You might also see about generating a figure using the data in the shared file that we imported in that code chunk. Another question for you to think about, if you have code in a say a, a utility script called code utilities.r or something else like that, where would you run that source command to load the functions from that utilities.r file? I feel strongly that R Markdown and other literate programming tools are a huge step forward in improving the transparency and reproducibility of any analysis. Not only can someone rerun the code to generate the paper, but they can see the code used to generate the numbers in the manuscript within the context of the actual text describing the relevance of the results. We saw our markdown documents before when we looked at the Meadow paper published in the journal Microbiome. If you look back at that file, you notice they used our markdown to generate what you might consider a research notebook type of document. That's a great way of walking people through an analysis in a less rigid manner than we typically see in a manuscript. My preference is to also make those type of documents, but to use them more in a data exploration phase of a project and to use the tools we talked about today to prepare a polished manuscript that's ready for submission. Next time, we'll go all in and actually write our own write.paper function that allows us to start from an empty directory and end with a PDF version of our manuscript. We'll be using a tool called Make that will allow us to make our driver script more sophisticated and will allow us to restart the pipeline at any step in the workflow. Talk to you next time.